Hello, everyone. Welcome, our friends, our students all over the world. You've been speaking with Gisela Okerman, our colleague already, who has set up our discussion uh, with everyone sharing where you're from in the world and joining us tonight. It's so much fun to chat with each other. Do remember, I'm sure Gisela will be telling you, uh, reminding, to put the questions in the question box if you can to make sure we catch all your questions at the end because we don't want to miss any. We are Leonard Puy, Dr. Leonard Puy, who is, has his doctorate and is French and is very young and even so young has a pile of published articles like that about all different kinds of subjects in art history. Um, it's in, as we well know, in the English-speaking world, we say publish or perish in the academic world. Leonard doesn't have to worry for a long time because he's already published before 30 that he's going to last a long, long time. Thank you can you. ask him questions ranging from Game of Thrones trivia yeah. to what was military symbolism among the Dutch master painters in the 17th century? He's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's Leonard Puy. He's French. He's like the jewelry we're looking at tonight. He's very young. He's very new. The De Beers piece on the right is very current and contemporary. And then there's me. I'm very antique, like the antique piece that's on the left. A long, long ago, I studied, uh, mine is Ida Gay Eckel. I studied art history at Princeton, and then I had too long a, a history to tell you about, ranging from Cartier to Tiffany to Van Cleef and Arpels. Been with the school since the very beginning, and very excited to be with you tonight with my friend and colleague Leonard to talk about talismans, gems, and marvels. What do we mean by all that? We have two great pieces for you to look at as we talk about what that means, and also to set up the kind of discussion we're going to have in an hour, because the history of talismans, amulets, protective, apotropaic gems goes back to when we began being human because we've been interested in protecting ourselves, protecting our children especially, since when we started being able to be defined by anthropologists as human beings. So starting off, Leonard, tell, you want to tell us a little bit about Empress Maria's bula? Exactly. So <laughs> As you're going to see, we're going to build bridges between epochs, between regions, between cultures. There are going to be lots of time travel, space travel, of course, also. Since we are contained, we want to travel a lot. And here we go in the earliest days of the uh, Christian Empire in uh, uh, Rome, but in Europe, basically, because Maria was the wife of the first uh, emperor of uh, Europe, as per se, which was uh, Honorius. And here it's quite a fascinating piece we have on the, on the left because it's, it's both uh, a reliquary, so a very typical Christian uh, jewel which is supposed to contain something holy. And here it's uh, dirt, it's uh, soil from the Holy Land, from uh, Jerusalem. So kind of a, a very, very interesting uh, um, relic. But then it's also, of course, a jewel. It's, it's, it's in gold, it's set with uh, emerald and rubies, and we're going to see that those stones at some point were quite feminine uh, uh, before that sapphire uh, uh, reigned in, uh, over the Middle Ages. And then we have this Chalcedony stone. We have this uh, polychromous, bichromous uh, stone, red and white, which is carved. It's a cameo. And in, in the pattern, it's quite complex. We see two main shapes. We see an X and we see a P. And the X in Greek is the letter key. And the P is the letter Rho, and it's actually the two first letters for the name of uh, Jesus, of the Christ, uh, Christos. And so you have to imagine that at that time uh, in Christianity, there was no logo official. There was no, not like the cross like today. So they were still kind of figuring out which symbol to follow. And if you look on the very, very symbol of, uh, on the very center of this uh, uh, pattern, you'll find this tiny cross. I'll, I'll zoom on it for you, which is actually from uh, Egyptian origin. And then it looks like an ankh. It's an ankh. Yeah. It's basically an ankh. It's also the uh, Coptic cross. It's it's it's, quite, mm. it's still used today actually. And you see that the shape is actually uh, made out of the names of uh, those very people we are talking about. The people she, uh, she are important in her life. Exactly. Her Herself. father, her mother. Exactly. Her yeah. husband. And they all mix and match in a way, in order to make this jewel very very efficient. What I love powerful. is that in the middle, going across the middle, vivatis, exactly. living. Uh, sadly, and this is kind of what we're going to be, this is just jumping right into what we're talking about tonight. We thought we'd give you something fun to look at while we talk about it. A talisman. What is a talisman? It comes from Arabic, actually, tilazm, through to French, through to English, talisman, tilazm. And then before that, from Greek, teleos. And in, in, in Greek, and in terms of 
the way you can look at a talisman, it's something that's created to protect. Now, that can be to ward off illness. It can be for positive imagery. It can be, and we like to say that a talisman could be the way we look at it, and for instance, in our course that we have at Lake Cole, is to say that could be, what is your talisman? It could be the watch your mother gave you when you left for college, because your mother gave you that for you to be able to watch your, for her watching over you and watching your time for you to succeed. Yeah. It's, it's multicultural. It's something that ties all human beings together. In fact, it shows us how much we have in common, even though, of course, the cultural differences are, can be very specific. This bulla, a bulla was a little globe that held something to protect, especially children. On the right, this concoction, this really vivid concoction of rough diamonds, uh, looks very ancient, but it's, 20, it's really 21st century, around the turn of the century, and it was to celebrate the year, it was 2018, this one in particular is 2018, but the concoction, the creation of it, was to celebrate De Beers getting the privilege to open retail boutiques all over the world. It actually was Guy Marie and his team who thought it up and wanted to go against what you normally thought of for De Beers. The, <clears throat> the consciousness of De Beers was bling bling, it was brilliant cut, it was big, bright, brilliant diamonds. They had an intuitive and inspirational idea to look at ancient use of diamonds, the ancient use of diamonds as protective symbols, which we're going to get into plenty tonight. And maybe that's a time to look at how we're dividing up our time together. We, we always, we have a tradition with these, we call them evening conversations, and even though we're virtual, you're still conversing. And that's why we put a lot of emphasis on the Zoom and the chatting with Gisela and, and us to talk at the end and keep talking. So it's a conversation, not a lecture. It's a conversation between the two of us. And a good way to divide up a conversation like that is into three parts. So we have three chapters. The first one we're going to see will be talking about the stones, the very material those talismans and uh, amulets we're talking about are made of. Then we're going to move to the protective bestiary. So this what we call the protective bestiary. And this may sound a little uh, astounding because animals, animals in a gemstones discussion? Well, actually... Yeah, did we get off track? <laughs> we said we were talking about stones. But the animals are important. We're going to see why. There's many reasons, actually, why animals we and do stones spoilers, would, be, right? yeah, would be connected at the time. I'm the spoiler. I'm going to restrain and myself. Then, last but not least, of course, we'll tell you about the legends, the myths, the, all the wonderful stories that also are associated with uh, those talismans and... Uh, um, amulets um, since almost the origin uh, of their creations. Tales and wonders, so that'll be our last chapter. But let's start with the stones and uh, uh, already some legends and uh, maybe a good stone to start with would be not diamond, not sapphire, not emerald not, or ruby, actually it would be carnelian. Everybody might be sitting up in their chairs for a second here and saying, oh, what a, it's very nice but this is talking about gems. This is a yeah. school about gems. Why this very pretty red stone, this carnelian? And why do we show you the rough, big chunks of the rough? Because we always want to be in touch when we're looking at amuletus, is one of the words for an amulet, which is to protect. Looking at these symbols that have been used since the beginning of time to look at how our ancestors might have first noticed these stones and did indeed notice these stones, which were very hard, very difficult to carve, very red. And what did red mean? Red meant blood. It meant the blood of life. It meant the sun that gives warmth, that gives life. It meant courage. That's having the blood rise that gives you courage. It meant protection against losing blood. Good heavens. Therefore, a red stone, the red color and power was feminine at the time and for a long long time until very very recently in the linear chronology the power of the goddesses was the power of the goddesses not the gods so red was associated with the feminine and red was the force of feminine power and health and birth and life therefore that's why we find a type of bead it's not really a bead it's, it's, it can be this big, it can be like this, giant oblong forms from a place in Pakistan that are combined with the blue, so red and blue. Uh, I was just reading this afternoon uh, a, a dissertation that was done at Columbia about the red and the blue in Ur, in, this, in the civilization of Ur. Civilization of Ur, a lot of it is lost. There was so much destruction and so many wars, but we do know that pieces like this are around 4,200 years old. 
4,200 years old. And look at how modern it looks with these long red beads that are from a very special place in Pakistan, far, Harappa. far away, right? The Harappan beads, they're called. Uh, when we can all go back to the Louvre together, the Louvre has giant vitrines just of these Harappan beads that we can look at together, I hope. Uh, but the red and the blue, very, very important. And look at the type of savoir-faire that was needed 4,200 or 4,400 years ago to, to carve this very hard stone into those exquisite, translucent, oblong beads, which are married to the blue of the... Lapis lazuli. Of course, when you think about carnelian at that time, you also have to mention lapis, just like we have to mention the red, we have to mention the blue. It's like the French and the American flag in a way. They were yes. like contrast colors. They were really uh, a, a very strong association, just like black and white or, or green and red today. Uh, they were like oppositions and blue was also kind of uh, masculine in a way in opposition of the red. But just like take a, uh, let's take a step back from a minute because we are talking about Mesopotamia here. We're talking about this country in between two rivers, the Tigris and the uh, Euphrates. And there was no, uh, uh, as you said, the Canadian was coming from Pakistan, from pretty far away. Same thing with Lapis. It was coming from uh, Afghanistan. So you have to imagine that there was already this cr very, very evolved and, and refined craftsmanship made by people who didn't have those stones. There was already commercial routes, links, associations, kind of a, a system already at stake here and all uh, uh, concentrating for savoir-faire in, uh, in Mesopotamia. So of course the blue was a very, very uh, highly appreciated uh, uh, color. It was the color of the sky. It was very heavenly. It was supposed in Egypt to be the color of the hair of the gods. Mm -hmm. and, and also uh, lapis lazuli, um, you know today is more like a rock than a stone in a way because it contains elements, golden elements. Of course today we know it's not gold, we know it's uh, pyrite. And here we have a beautiful example to, to show you, rough uh, lapis lazuli per se, an example coming from uh, L'Ecole des Mines uh, in Paris, uh, uh, quite a fantastic place to, oh, to yes. visit if you like. It's uh, where we uh, did our diamond, uh, art and science of diamond Absolutely. a few weeks ago. Absolutely, and you can see definitely why uh, people were fascinated and uh, appreciated lapis uh, at that point. So we also show you a, a shoker. Uh, um, very, very modern in a way. It could be Artico, I don't know. Right. Very, very 20s. And associating, once again, a lapis lazuli with uh, gold. But what is also quite fascinating with lapis is that uh, it didn't come out of fashion. And even in, through the Middle Ages, it stood as one of the let's, main... Let's just make sure people know that it's so shocking, really. 2500 BC. It's in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. 2500 BC that juxtaposition of the pyramids in gold and... Exactly, so modern. And if we talk about lapis, and if we talk about color blue, then it would be also very successful in France in the Middle Ages, and for specific reasons. Yeah, why was it so successful in France in the Middle Ages? It's kind of a practical reason to start with, is that because, and Leonard set it up so well, explaining that it comes from so far away, it is so beautiful, it's a color that endures, it doesn't change. Therefore, to trade for it was in, became more and more expensive. And guess what? Lapis lazuli becomes more expensive than gold. All right. If lapis lazuli is more expensive than gold, obviously, it's the ultimate status symbol. You are a royal. Anywhere in Europe, you want to have and use lapis lazuli. You want to use it for paintings. So in the painting on the left, a very specific person now begins to have more and more the robe, her robe, in blue. It's interesting because you may look, if you look at medieval paintings anywhere near as much as I do, I'm totally obsessed by medieval art. I'm working on a few to share with you, a few little films to share with you soon on the social media, on our social media platforms on medieval art, medieval jewels especially. You will see that often the sea in medieval paintings has, is green. That was not deliberate. Another related mineral, azurite, was used to paint the sea because it was less expensive and it turned green. For the Virgin Mary, an evolution has happened. The Virgin Mary now needs to wear a blue robe instead of a red robe. Around the 12th or the 13th century, you start seeing a change where the Virgin Mary's red robe turns blue. Or there will be a red robe underneath. It's kind of like they want to still be in contact with that feminine goddess power, the power of birth, the power of life that is there from antiquity, but now they're moving away and covering with the blue robe for several really good reasons. 
First of all, the Virgin Mary is being elevated in importance because people are converting from various pre-Christian traditions and they're missing their feminine goddesses. So as the church evolves, the church is elevating the Virgin Mary to a, a higher and higher position. Believe it or not, many of the Notre Dame churches you find in, in Europe are planted on top of what used to be a temple of Isis. So Virgin Mary begins to acquire this blue rope and we want her to be number one, most important. Remember what I said, the lapis lazuli is incredibly expensive. It is now becoming the symbol of the ultimate in royalty. It's now turning up on the blazon, on the herald, on the heraldic symbols. So if you have a royal shield that has the blue with the gold lilies, it's good to also have the blue robe on the Virgin Mary. But play a little game with me. As we look at medieval paintings, not today, but when we go forward, Notice that there will be red robes peeking from underneath. And in this case, I love this painting because they sort of put her on a red couch. So they're staying in touch with the red, but they're moving toward using the lapis. And on the right, we showed you the actual powdered lapis because we want you to remember the incredible pricelessness of working this way in the art. These were uh, prayer books or lapidaries or bestiaries, we'll talk about them, that were made for the very wealthy. There's no printing, there's no Google, there's no internet, there's nothing. You sit in church all day in a very cold church, it's very dark, it's very dark all winter. So if you can afford a prayer book that has a lot of great art in it, it's your, it's your divertissement, it's your entertainment, and it's the ultimate status symbol. Exactly. So we've been talking about the mother of gods, but there was also kind of a mother of stones already at that time, still in medieval, in medieval times. It would be a rock crystal. I like what you said, mother of stones. That's a nice lead in because it is literally seen as the mother of stones by the, the people who are, let's remember again, we have to remember information was precious and rare. Information belonged to the very few. And a lot of our information in Europe was guarded by religious people religious people who were great scholars. And one of my personal favorites is Marbaud of Rennes. So here is Marbaud, this scholarly uh, monk who becomes a, becomes a bishop, uh, spending his life compiling the ancient lapidaries, compi compiling ancient knowledge. And he makes it rhyme, too. It's also beautiful yeah, poems. Poet. We yeah. can't really show, tell you that tonight because we're speaking to you in English and we're not making it rhyme. But these are beautiful it's called Francois, it's old French, medieval French, and it rhymes beautifully. Now what was said about the rock crystal? Why was the rock crystal so important? Believe it or not, rock crystal was one of the most valuable gems. Why was it so valuable? Well, it was believed that it may have been the earliest gem, and it was believed that it was water itself. That what's, what's, what Marbaud is saying in this Francois, in this medieval French, he's saying the ancients tell us that crystal is natural ice, and through the ages, the cold hardens it more and more and more until finally its nature changes. It's interesting, it's, it's in a way not that far away from the actual genesis of rocks. The nature changes and it becomes this crystal. Among its many virtues, it is very good for nursing mothers. Somehow, it says, that we don't have the dosage, as Leonard always likes to say when we talk about it, but somehow, if you gave powdered rock crystal in the right quantity to nursing mothers, they could have very plentiful milk. Once again, our discussion tonight is about protection. It's about especially, uh, we'll be giving you some books at the end written by a great scholar on talisman named Claude Le Couteux. And he, I guess when you have ample time and innumerable numbers of devoted students at the Sorbonne, he spent 25 years having his students compile, actually statistically, what were talismans made for during the medieval tradition. And something like 67% were made to protect children, to ward off disease for children. Exactly. And therefore, if you could nourish your children with abundant milk, and remember, food was scarce, your children were likely to survive. Once again, we've shown you this form, the bulla, this, this, that you can see a lot in, in pilgrim's badges too, which is a little globe that actually contains important things, stuff that will keep your children healthy. Mm, exactly. And it was Assisted with, like, because of the mil milky appearance. Also. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot milk. to say, of course. If you look at rock yeah. crystal, it has uh, 
inclusions which look milky, yeah. of course. And yeah. this is about the law of analogies. This is the law of correspondences yeah. that we look at. In fact, I, I forgot. I wanted to bring you a walnut tonight because Valerie Gontero Laws, the fantastic scholar who wrote a book that we depend yeah. on a lot for this lecture, very, very important lady, says that she likes to tell her students in Marseille, in X, at the University of X, yeah. yes, that she likes to bring a walnut to class and show them the walnut. The walnut looks like a human brain. So the law of correspondences led medieval people to believe that the walnut was good for the brain. And guess what? We now that's know true. that eating walnuts <laughs> is good for the brain. So that's the law of correspondences. If you saw a milky quality in the inclusions in the rock crystal, it would help to produce milk. Exactly. But Thank then you. Not, this we know is not so, so, so efficient. Oh, we're not prescribing. We're art historians. <laughs> we're not. <laughs> exactly. But still today in very, very Cartesian France, some people do believe uh, that uh, amber, for example, could also he uh, heal or help um, babies, children, to, to relieve the pain from uh, uh, the teeth to, to, to come. And, and then we know it could be super painful. I know right now, oh. actually, I spend my nights. Uh, oh, yes, Leonard has a new baby but, too, yes. <laughs> but uh, but you know. <laughs> yeah, but they actually also believe, well, now we also believe that. Uh, uh, Chokers and, and uh, yes, absolutely could make you choke. So, well, then again, uh, uh, the discussion is open. But what is quite interesting, as you said, those uh, those bishops, those um, uh, uh, cleric, were working in 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 order to interpret what was nature. Nature was seen as um, a, a universe that was uh, open to interpretation, and men had to uh, understand the function, the symbol. Uh, out of the shape, out of the color of all the elements without their plants or, or, or gems. And thanks to Pliny the Elder, thanks to uh, his natural history, we know that amber is actually not a stone. It's a fossilized uh, resin. It was uh, uh, floating uh, among salt water, so people were fascinated by it. And of course, it was a very, very bright, very yellow, very colorful. And even uh, uh, as early as the Mycenaean period, we are talking like before uh, Odyssey, yes. before uh, Homeric times, uh, it was associated with gold once again on a very, very large necklace, which pro probably also uh, special properties and uh, characteristics. Mo moving on, of course, we have to uh, talk about some of the gems that we that we still use today, of course. And we are getting are around popular. to the precious gems. We are getting exactly. around to what the GIA calls the big four. We're starting with diamond. The picture we're showing you is not a very blingy. It's, we're showing you uh, a young man sort of plucking a diamond about 20 times the size of the cullen and rough out of a rock. And he's plucking that into some place that these lapidaries would believe were somewhere very far away. They would believe that if you could get to those places, if you could understand where the diamonds might be, you would pick them up like that. They were interested in these diamonds. Why? And they were interested in finding out why. Well. If we can look at the etymon, it's called, E-T-Y-M-O-N, the origin of the word, as we did with talisman. The origin of the word is adamas. It means unconquerable. And the, to say unconquerable means it cannot, it is completely invincible. As we know, only a diamond can cut a diamond. So once again, they weren't all that far off. They understood, they found out that it had this hardness, and they invested all kinds of belief in the diamond, going all the way from before Pliny the Elder, but written down by Pliny the Elder. And in this case, our friend again, Marbode of Rennes, in his... Um, in his Francois, talks about De Adamante, of the diamond. He says the stone is very useful for those who cast spells <laughs> among sorcery. We're not going to get into sorcery, but he starts with that. Whoever wears it and can see it, so whoever wears it and can even see it, will be given strength and power. Connected with strength and power, you see, because it's invincible. Only the diamond can cut the diamond. All the way back in Greek legend, the plow of Kronos, creating time, was seen to be made of Adamas. The chains that held Prometheus were made of Adamas. These are male powers. So in the medieval times, we're connecting this to male power and royal power. Uh, so given strength and power, it protects against, now what does it protect against? Nightmares, ghosts, Venom, that's the venom of snakes, and snakes were everywhere. We, we hadn't started destroying nature. You could be bitten by a snake anywhere. There was no way to cure it. And all mortal poisons. Everyone was afraid of being poisoned. That's why royals always had tasters, the poor guy who had to taste all their food, and they would watch to see if he died before they ate their food. 
it, re it completely removes anger and tension. So it completely de-stresses you and takes away all anger. It brings reason back to mad men. So if you're crazy, it's a complete cure, better, better than, than any kind of medicine. And to sum up, it's better, it's worth far more than any good physician, any more doctor. Now, hold on, where in here do we have love? Where in here do we have beauty? We don't see too much of that. We're not, people were not seeking that from diamonds. They were seeking protection, power, strength, and all these other wonderful things. The diamond was admired and loved for its form, for its shape. It was wanted in the largest possible shape. If it's making you powerful, if the atomos makes you atomos, makes you powerful, why do you want to cut half of it away to make a brilliant cut? There's no kind of interest in that yeah. until a good, three, four hundred years yeah. later. You want to be, you want the actual diamond in its crystal form. You want to find it. And they weren't far off about uh, when we did our art and science of diamonds with Olivier, as Olivier Segura says very well, secondary deposits, when you did find them, it's not all that much unlike. It would be by streams yeah. and you would find them and you would want to keep them when you found them. They were in southern India. They were nowhere near Europe. And it's the same thing we, we say to show you uh, uh, this beautiful picture also of um, <coughs> Cleric, once again, uh, looking at stones uh, near a river. So once again, it's the illustration of this second deposit ID, and we can see that all those stones are associated one with each other. There's no, no mines, no, no, no idea for, um, uh, like we, we know today, of course, our first deposit when we have to go to, through, through the rock. Here it's just waiting for you along the beach. It's quite a pleasant uh, yeah. uh, idea. And, uh, but since we, you've been talking about the diamond, you have to imagine that at that, at that time, Diamond was, didn't have the importance it has today because of didn't have the sparkle, didn't yes. have the fire yet. Uh, it was all about the color. And since blue was the most fashionable color, of course, the sapphire was the most appreciated uh, uh, stone. It was considered, con considered as the gem of the gems. I'm here uh, quoting once again uh, Marbot de Rennes. And of course, it had uh, specific powers also. And among the many powers sapphire had, well, there was <laughs> quite a, a, an interesting one. Let's say you're in jail and you're lucky enough to have a sapphire in your pocket. That can happen. <laughs> you just have to rub the sapphire against the barrel of your, of your jail and then you'll be set free. So once again, it's, 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 it, it, there's, no, um, there's only a legendary or there's no uh, actu um, actual uh, scienti scientific scientifically facts around it. But just to give you the idea of how those stones were appreciated, they, had, they were magical. They were like, they had superpowers. For literally. me, it literally. means you put the sapphire up against the bar, the guard saw it, the guard wanted it, he came and opened the door so you could get out. But I don't know, then again, he could just kill you and take it. So, but maybe there was some kind of medieval he gave it rule to about I don't that. know. So this is just a, a few examples. And of course, there was already some, some knowledge in, in terms of gemology because uh, we know there was a difference yes. between lapis and sapphire. And when you were crushing those stones into power, you would get totally different uh, um, uh, colors. You, would, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't use them for the same, so same thing. And uh, we are, what is quite uh, uh, interesting is that when we talk also about a color symbol, uh, some color which are quite, uh, uh, let's say, naive, so they are, are um, they inoffensive, they were, they were uh, harmless. harmless as a green. Well, at that time, green has a total different meaning. Yes, let's, the reason why we are showing you a picture actually from a book was the book of Sidrak, which was a, a scholar who was teaching a king about, about everything that was yeah. wise and everything that was good. We're showing you that because it's, it's a complex stone. It's, a, it's in, the, in the, the Francois that we're quoting from again, the very first thing that Marbaud says yeah. is emeralds by their color surpass all others in the vitality of their green. But let's talk about the green. The color green and the emerald itself, we can say, was the vaccine stone. Why do I say that? Well, it's very timely at this moment. And, and often with recently what's been going on, I've been saying to my friends, welcome back to the Middle Ages, because an unknown disease that could take away those we love and we don't have a cure for it. And we're trying to find yeah. something apotropaic to keep it away, aren't we? Well, the emerald could be the vaccine stone. Why? On the one hand, it's said that Lucifer had a third eye. And as we know, uh, God was supposed to chase Lucifer. He'd been a, an angel originally, was chased out of heaven for being bad. And when he was flying out of heaven, he lost his third eye. 
So the emerald third eye tumbles to the ground and eventually was turned into, without getting too complicated, was turned into the Holy Grail, the cup yeah. that everyone was looking for all during the Middle Ages. And if you're a Monty Python fan, you know exactly how everyone was looking for it. So this Holy Grail was, from emerald, was the emerald from Lucifer's eyes. Hold that thought from Lucifer's third eye. The green is also the green of springtime, of healing. Uh, look for a pharmacy in Europe and on a Sunday, and you want to know one's open. You look down the street, and if you see the clignote, the clinking, clinking, uh, blinking green light, you know there's a pharmacy for healing. It's a symbol of healing. Now, how did that happen? How is it the symbol of everything that's beautiful, the gardens of paradise, healing, spring, life? That's very evident. And yet also the venom of snakes, or we say the green eyes of jealousy, that you look with green eyes when you have jealousy, the green eyes of envy. And yet, on the other hand, it was thought to literally heal eyes. Yeah. So connected. So something that had been bad also could yeah. heal eyes. Scholars who read too much were supposed to look at emeralds. Nero supposedly had, uh, this is before Christ was, was, was much thought about, but it, it was thought about, but it was quite controversial. But Nero was supposed to have had emerald eyeglasses made for himself to calm his eyes. So what is a vaccine? A vaccine is taking something very bad, extracting what is good out of something's very bad and using it for the very best purposes, isn't it? You could say that the emerald is the vaccine of gems. Exactly. Why not? Exactly. And uh, if, we have to, if we had to, to choose a, a stone actually that had all the powers, that combined all those characteristics, you would pick at that time a red stone. Of course, we've, we've seen that red was very, very popular, but you also have to imagine that stones were, uh, um, uh, were observed as uh, the material equivalent of light. It was, it was seen as what was light when there was no light. Let's say you're in a, a dark, cold night and you have a, a red stone with you, then you're, you're okay, then you have the fire with you. And among all the red stones, uh, we didn't make the difference between rubies or spinels at that time. We, were, we would be called them escarbuncle. And escarbuncle, the, the word uh, escarbuncle, uh, would come from a burning coal, some, something very, very bright, very Glowing hot. Glowing charcoal in your and fire. Very, very uh, uh, life, actually, yeah. because uh, uh, life and light was the same thing. It was a fire, something that heals you, something well, that's cooking your food, something that makes you warm. If the fire went out, once again, there was no, no little, uh, what do you call those things, those little lighter <laughs> things, tiptoe or what, yes, uh, but the, there's a funny word for the ones that are automatic. Can't think of it because I don't smoke. But if the fire went out and you didn't have a way to start it, First you got cold, then you starved to death. Things weren't good. There exactly. was no electric light, days were short, you needed your fire. So looking at the, and in an interesting way, it's good gemology, because it's exactly what we do now. We yeah. say Fanta for uh, a mandarin garnet. We yeah. say all these colors. So the glowing charcoal, that inner fire, which a ruby can have, yeah. was exactly what they would describe. And for this reason, we saw that escarbuncle were coming out of dragon's mouth. It was coming from the it's fire origin. <laughs> so it's still, it's analogy, it's still, it's, it, it, it may sound esoteric, but it, it has some logic to it, it has some reason, and this logic evolved to modern day science, actually. So, you know, as a wrap up, as a conclusion, we wanted to show you this magnificent piece, this uh, uh, masterpiece, uh, really, which is combining two main colors, the green and the red. The blue is here totally absent. It actually does it all. There are two missing stones, but we're not sure what they were, but it does it all even without those missing stones yeah. because it is an M for the Virgin Mary. It's probably mid-1300s. It's, it's in the new college at Oxford. It's called the Heil Jewel. It's uh, mid to late 1300s, maybe around 1400, I think a little earlier. And the, it's very architectural. It's like a Gothic. Yeah. Church. A gothic arch and a gothic church, yeah. and it's an arch that's M, and in the two parts of the M, the medieval jewelers and medieval artists like to be very specific. They made things very clear. That's one of the things I adore. There's this naive simplicity and expression that's very, very great. So we have the M, and in each part of the M, there's the Virgin Mary and the angel. On the left is the angel of the Annunciation, telling the Virgin Mary that she's going to become immaculately pregnant and Christ is going to be born. In the middle of the M, the actual column of the M, you have the beautiful red uh, vase Sorry. that has the lilies growing out of it. And it's ex that part is exquisitely carved ruby, very translucent. So it's not that, the, you know, we have to be careful. It's not that they didn't 
understand the value and the beauty of gems and, and how to carve them and how to polish them. They had a very sophisticated understanding, but they were using it for their purposes. So in this case, that vase from which the lily of the Immaculate Conception is coming, and the lilies are done in enamel, and then the, the leaves are in ruby, all of that is exquisitely done. And then pointing up to the top of the arch, what do we have at the top of the arch? We have a crown for royal power, the, the analogy between the royal power of the royals and the royal power of the Queen of Heaven, Virgin Mary. And in the middle of the crown, there it is, the Adamas, the diamond, a little tiny diamond. The diamonds had to come from the south of India, from the Deccan, far, far, far away, what we know as Golconda. So when you had even one diamond, it was fabulous. You didn't want to make it smaller. You took it as you found it, and you stuck it into the most important place. And let's not forget the pearls. We won't start on the pearls. Both Leonard and I could go on till next year about <laughs> pearls. We won't. But the pearls are an ultimate symbol, which we're not getting into too much tonight. Actually, there will be many, many stones to, to talk about, and uh, we only have so, so, right. so short time. But um, in the same idea, there was those uh, lapidaries. The, the word lapidary, gem, uh, stone cutter in, Fran in French, come from those books, those encyclopedic uh, books, which were associating, which were making lists of all those stones. But they were not only listing stones, they were listing actually everything, just like Pliny in his time. And there was also, they were also list, list, uh, listing animals. And at some point, things get a little confusing because some gems were con considered as living beings, living animals, and you had to take care of them if you wanted them to glow, if you wanted them to be efficient, and even to grow and, 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 uh, and uh, prosper in a way. It was actually believed that if you did the right comportment, if you took the right care of these gems, they could even reproduce. We like to say, we like to imagine how much people must have invested effort and energy into trying to figure out how to make rubies, diamonds, sapphires, and pearls reproduce. So you would find the gems right in the middle of a book about animals. That's why exactly. second chapter mixes animals and gems. And when we talk Favorite about subjects living for both creatures, us. when we talk about insects and amulets, the first thing that comes to your mind would be scarabs, automatically. So it's a beetle, it's an insect. It's a not a very pretty insect. It's an insect that lives in a dung, in dung, in manure. But it's an, a very special kind of manure and a very special insect because it's an insect that buries its eggs. When it buries its eggs in the dung, it moves exactly the way the sun moves from rising to noon to setting, the three suns of the day. That's extremely important in Egyptian belief. It, the cycle for the eggs to hatch is exactly the same cycle as the month. Of, the, of a year, the sun cycle, the solar cycle. The Egyptians from very, very early times decided that this beetle, this kepri, K-H-E-P-R-I, was, was associated with life itself, especially with a particular phase of the sun. The and morning sun. Yeah. The morning sun, the yeah. rising sun. Yeah. And that, that's why you will see in Egyptian art often a man's body with a beetle on top because that's Kepri, that's the god Kepri. Yeah. But the scarab can be, tr the, the Egyptians were very practical, so th if the scarab can do that, it can also save life. And life has to be saved after death, because if you don't save the life of the pharaohs after death, your whole, the whole Egyptian society would fall apart. And it lasted a long time, didn't it? So you find literally millions of scarabs in Egyptian art and jewelry. You find scarabs on the mummies' wrappings, the bandages of the mummies. Every time a wrapping was closed, you could find more scarabs. You could find scarabs on a fabulous ring like the ring on the left, which is made of carnelian, our very first red stone from tonight, the stone of life. The carnelian is its about 1500 maybe to 1000 BC, so around 3,000 years old. It's in the Louvre Museum. It looks incredibly modern. I have to remind people how old it is. Look at the exquisitely wrapped wire of the gold. So gold and the actual beetle carved in the red carnelian. Perfect symbol, a symbol you would wear on your ring in life, and then you would take it with you after death to stay alive. The Book of the Dead, we're going to give you a reference for the Book of the Dead at the end, is a very well explained book, it's also known as better way to call it, I think, is the Book of Awakening, because you were not supposed to die, you were supposed to stay alive after death. The piece on the right, comparing a very modern piece, the actual essential incarnation of glamour of the Roaring Twenties, is a big, big piece made by Cartier in 1924, two years after the discovery of King Tutankhamun's tomb. And it incorporates 
ancient faience, the blue stuff, is actually something, it's a very highly pot fired pottery glass mm. substance. And it incorporates a modern carved obsidian scarab. And it's a very glamorous piece for a very glamorous lady like this. Really, really big. It's in the Cartier Museum now. But it's taking into account the exact structure, artistic structure, of an Egyptian piece, isn't it? The wings flying, because it's the flying yeah. scarab of the rising sun. Exactly. And, and uh, the Egyptian style, which is actually not accurate, but Tutankhamun style, is definitely part of the DNA of the Art Deco style from the uh, second half of the 1920s. In and America, I'm, we call it Tatmania, and in France, you call it Egyptomanie. Egyptomanie. It was like a, a disease. It was like a curse for people. They were obsessed with Egypt. They were, all the jewelers were making Egyptian jewels. And I wish Cartier had kept Capri as a mascot, let's say, as a, as a favorite animal. But when we talk about animal and jewelry, and if we talk about snakes, of course, there's a maison that comes to your mind. It would be Bulgari. But actually, Bulgari was not the first to use snakes for their uh, pieces, even though they do it very well. Uh, actually, as early as the late 19th century, uh, Frédéric Boucheron was offering uh, uh, jewelry. He would design himself for his wife, uh, made out of the shape of uh, a snake. Cartier did it also in the 60s. Actually, if we if we take a step back, uh, snake would be probably one of the most appreciated uh, symbol, animal, associating with luck, with power, with protection. Even though the Christians sought, sought to associate it with evil, if you look in ancient Mediterranean, in Greece, in Rome, the Etruscans, snake would be extremely positive. It's this idea of eternal life, of eternity, the Ouroboros in, Gre in, in Greek, it's the, the snake that bites its own tail. It losing its skin to, to renew it's like eternal life. It's an extremely positive uh, sign. And of course, you'll find it everywhere in gold around the Mediterranean, just like this beautiful uh, uh, arm bracelet we have. And it feels it like, it feels like uh, Elizabeth Taylor would wear, wear uh, such a, a piece of jewel for our Cleopatra movie. This is in the Louvre, movie. absolutely. It's in the Louvre, and when the Louvre opens up again, again, we hope you're here in Paris with us. We'll take you to see it. I've, I go and look at it very, very often. It's so beautiful. And again, who would believe that that was ancient? <laughs> exactly. It looks very modern. It could be absolutely worn uh, today. Maybe one of the reasons why also snakes were not so popular in the Middle, middle, middle Ages it was because of the connection of dragons, of this very dangerous animal, totally legendary, of course, but still very, very popular, very, very frightening for, for people. Remember what we had been talking about, about before the beginning of the common era, the uh, feminine goddess was all powerful. Yeah. It was a conflict that happens with the beginning of the common era, with the beginning of the, these traditions, the Judeo-Christian traditions, um, and we get involved with Eve tempting being tempted by the snake to eat the apple. And of course, tasting the apple causes them to be, cause Adam and Eve to be chased from the Garden of Eden. In this miniature on the left, which I just adore, we this miniature is a perfect example to show us the connection between the serpent and the dragon and between the, the serpent image as the feminine, tied up with the feminine goddess image. The snake was the symbol of Isis, the mother goddess. It was the symbol of this eternal life. Uh, now the snake is turning into a woman and kind of a dragon-like figure too. If you look curving around the tree, it has its trunk going around the tree. Very practical, very basic and practical, mm -hmm. like I said about the Middle Ages. Very fun. And it's, it's inclining toward Eve to make her taste of eternal mortal sin. Uh, it, this is connected, and it's funny, Leonard, you pointed out earlier to me that the dragon actually looks like a dinosaur too, but what <laughs> memory do people have of dinosaurs? Skeletons. It looks like a dinosaur. Maybe they saw skeletons, who knows? But it, this dragon evolves from the snake that has fallen from grace, and the poor dragon has truly fallen from grace. It's chased by St. Michael and St. George. Everybody does horrible things to try to kill the dragon. The dragon becomes a symbol of everything bad, and yet again, the green, because you look at this picture of the dragon on the right, it's uh, red and green. So the red force and the green force. The dragon is, we love to show you this because it's illustrating exactly the medieval consciousness about what the dragon was. He's so scary and he's so big, he's so Game of Thrones really, that he's flying off the page of the book. They never do this in, in the medieval rules. They don't break the planes yeah. of the frames and have something, something do that in a very modern way, flying right off the page. But the reason why that's done is to, to hit the consciousness about the dragon being the symbol of everything bad.
Exactly. Whereas in China, in Asia, in whole Asia, actually, there's nothing as positive as a dragon. It's associated with luck. It's associated with everything you can wish for for a, a marvelous life, actually. And they wouldn't bear to watch someone oh, no. kill a dragon. For them, it would be like the, the most uh, hor horrifying uh, crime, actually. And this is quite interesting. Which led us to think of somewhere where the dragon is being rehabilitated, right? Nowadays, the dragon is getting a better treatment. There's how to, to raise yeah. your dragon, and there's the little Game movies of, of the kids taking care of the dragon, and Game of Thrones. In Game of Thrones, the dragon can be both bad and good, right? That's quite interesting because it's a, it's a real shift in uh, uh, Western culture. It, it's basically, that uh, dragon is as good or bad as what you make of it. And this is actually not medieval thought. This is, this is really modern. So maybe maybe in Europe or, or, or the US, maybe now the dragons will start to be positive again, just like uh, in Asia. Well, we thought we would show you this piece from the Game of Thrones jewelry designers. Yeah. The ladies who designed for the show, the show was so popular that they made uh, real diamond and gold yeah. and high jewel reversions. And the one that's being worn on the left is actually uh, right out of the show, but it's yeah. an actual high jewel piece. So we from thought that Michelle was fun Captain. to show you. Yeah. Of course, if we have to uh, pick some animals to, to tell you about, the lion would be one of the main uh, uh, topics, and it could also be a subject for a whole conference. And already in the uh, antiquity, lions were in the center of the picture. The lion becomes, of course, for Leo, for astrology, which we'll talk about in a minute, but it becomes uh, a royal symbol very early, and it becomes a symbol of something that needs to be tamed either conquered or tamed. Yeah. Hercules, of course, had to slay the Nemean lion, which will yeah. become very pertinent to something we're going to talk about right at the end. But in this case, a, a type of jewel that I adore is the Mistress of the Animals yeah. jewel. The Mistress of the Animals jewel on the left can be seen uh, in China, it can be seen in, in um, everywhere. And in this particular case, we chose an example from the Greek area. This one is from Rhodes. And it's a very, very fine example that's in the British Museum. There's also a wonderful one that's in the Cleveland Museum. But we chose this one because what's happening? The winged mistress goddess is taming the animals. The animals are, she's got her arms like this. It's almost like she's gone to a dog training class. And the lions, she said, down, stay. And the lions are down and they're staying. Look carefully at the tops of their heads and their tails that Leonard is showing you. They're in perfect formation, staying where she tells them to stay. There are many different varieties of Mistress of the Animals. Sometimes it's with birds, but we particularly love this one. We can't resist also showing you on the right the fibulas. Fibulas are used for closing clothing. There were no buttons, remember, so they're extremely important. Your robes, you would be shown to be who you were, and after all, you don't want your clothes to fall off. So the definition of your importance would be seen by the closing of your clothing, the fibula. Let's look where Leonard has kindly shown us the really blown up detail of how these lions are constructed completely from granulation. Save that thought. We'll get back to granulation. Exactly. And still today, of course, modern uh, Dion would be very popular. It's also thanks to, once again, uh, uh, Western culture. Let's say for um, kingdoms, especially in the West of Europe, lion would be the main uh, icon, would be the main uh, uh, image we'd refer to as a king. Uh, it's whether you're in, in Netherlands, whether you're in France, whether you're in England, Spain, Italy, you'll find dragons on flag, on flags, on many, many heraldry. Whether for Eastern Europe, it would be mainly uh, eagles. And this is why those two animals are actually quite popular if you look at jewelry from the Renaissance, from the 17th century. And here we show you a wonderful pendant. Once again, I'll show you a detail. And you can see that the whole shape of the lion is actually inspired by the shape of a Baroque pearl. And you have to imagine that Baroque was such an important thing for that time that we actually called the era. Baroque. The middle body, the middle of the body looks so golden in this picture, but the middle part of the body is a natural Baroque pearl. So the artist, and this was very common in the Renaissance, one of our favorite things about Renaissance jewels, obviously, the artist would find the pearl and think of something to create from the pearl, whether it was a boat, whether it was a baby, mm. whether it was a lion in this case. And once again, you'll find many lions in modern day jewelry, and especially uh, in the Maison Chanel, because it's all uh, uh, based, let's say, on the universe, on the inspiration of uh, Gabrielle Chanel herself, Coco Chanel, which was 
maybe the most superstitious uh, jeweler or creature, uh, designer, a stylist, of course. And she was of the sign of the Leo. And she was uh, uh, believing in her lucky star. She was believing in the five shape star. All of those symbols, which are now the DNA of the Maison Chanel. And this is why you'll find them on so many modern pieces, like this uh, 2012 uh, sautoir made out of uh, uh, lions, uh, uh, lucky stars, uh, and uh, a wonderful stone. I think it's rutilated quartz this, and this citrine. This is exactly. It's rutilated quartz, and it's what we call a citrine. And look at how they used in a very medieval way, really. Yeah. They used the inclusions, exactly. and they carved around the inclusions to make this piece. Okay. So we've been talking about lions. We have to talk about panther. And when you talk about panther, you think about Cartier. But then again, it's not a new thing. On the left, it is in no way a new piece, and yet it, it's a miniature, another one of these miniature illustrations that we made for a rich person who wanted to be knowledgeable. And uh, it's a, a really interesting guy. I had to check again this afternoon. I was afraid it was a typo because he was working in the 1200s. He was working in the 1100s into the 1200s. Look at that painting. It's uh, so, 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 so old. And it's... Um, an amazing manuscript. Every time I look at it, I start to just lose myself into it. But what's going on? It's not a Cartier Panther, even though the Cartier Panther on the right looks so similar. No, it's a medieval panther, about nine, 800 years old. And the panther has a whole group of animals following him, doesn't he? The animals that are following him are literally emerging from a wooden tree because they're coming out of the wood, the forest. They're following the panther obediently because the panther had the ability to attract all creatures of nature. The panther apparently in the belief of the time, remember there was no natural science yet, natural science grows out of this but comes along later, the panther was believed to have an exquisite scent mm. and this scent would cause everyone to be hypnotized and follow him. He also had another power, we could say an apotropaic power, in that he could repel the fearsome and dreaded dragon. So you see the creature on the right the poor dragon, in this, he has this woesome, uh, fearful, sad face with his wings in his place, turning away. He's terrified of the panther. Now, nowadays when we talk of panther, if we talk about it in the jewelry world, for sure we're immediately going to think of Jean Toussaint. We're going to think of Jean Toussaint who went in for her interrogation with the Nazis and, and walked out unscathed. She even was able to get out of that with no trouble. This Jean Toussaint, was, well, her nickname was the Panther because she was small, she was lithe, she was intelligent, she was commanding, and she also sent her artists, sent the jewelry yeah. designers to the Museum of Natural History to look at animals, to the zoo, to the Louvre, the Cartier family and Jean Toussaint asked their artists to be inspired from art history to draw their imagery, we like to call it iconography, from all of culture. And it's interesting because it looks like someone actually looked for this panther and drew it out of a medieval manuscript. To some extent, that was the consciousness. This piece is from 1988. It's from my time there. But I remember when they were making this, when they were designing it, they were talking about Jean Toussaint, and they were looking at yeah. the history. But that type of panther piece shows up extremely early in the Cartier history. Exactly. And then again, we could Talking talk about, about many, many animals, and not only real one, ones, but there's also many other fantastic animals, like griffins, for example, which could be also sources from, uh, of inspiration for, uh, for uh, uh, maisons like Van Cleef and Arpels, uh, for example. Here we have this, we have this let's say, uh, uh, interpretation of a griffin, because a griffin could also be uh, have the head of an eagle. It's actually very, very um, orientalist in a way. Look at it's, its claws. I love this. Look at the gold. It looks very Syrian, the pose, yeah. It looks very Syrian and uh, it looks actually Persian. It's, uh, it's even more oriental because there was also this uh, anniversary of the discovering of the Achaemenid uh, civilization in the 1970s, which was also the source for this uh, creation. It's both a protective animal and even himself uh, is wearing a piece of jewelry. This is why I, I like it. I love, like, yes. You have this uh, almost a body sound. I mean, <laughs> yes. On his, uh, um, and the combination of colors, body. the combination of materials, the coral, the body yeah, is coral, very bold. emerald, amethyst, gold, kind of granulation setting looking. Yeah. And this is a, the 2500 year birthday 
of Persepolis is exactly. what they're they're celebrating. Yeah. 1971, Van Cleef and Arpels, also very, very high cultural level of inspiration for its designers, looks back to the time and looks forward and makes this incredibly fun piece that leads us to our third chapter, which is the Tales and Wonders. Another name for that is Monsters and Marvels, because actually monster means monstrari, to show. Mm. So showing the wonders and telling the tales of the monsters could be quite marvelous. And among the very, very first tale uh, we know uh, of, actually, it would be the, the myth, the, the, the story of Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh, which, which was this king slash hero slash man slash half god, once again, a, a, a superhero in a way, uh, which, which was, he was seeking immortality. And it was like a whole quest, an initiative uh, um, quest, which would lead him to wonder the meaning of life, actually. And if we uh, follow his, his legend, his story, we'll find many, many stones on the way. We'll find stones that will help him, we'll find stones that will hurt him. And, and, and once again, it's kind of an interesting uh, idea to see that each stone would have a specific purpose. He would have a child out, out of uh, la lazarite and gold, he would have wheels out of gold, he would have, uh, uh, to protect himself, uh, amber. Exactly. So, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. But one of, Gilgamesh is pretty well known. And actually, I, I like a, a Ninurta story also. It's called the Lugal A. And it's the story of a, this Mesopotamian king who was fighting mountains. He was fighting uh, gigantic stones because actually in Mesopotamia, you don't have mountains. And mountains are uh, in the in Persian side, actually. But it's, it's, it's kind of an allegory because the only way if, um, he managed to fight the stones was to use water. And this is actually quite practical. And Ninurta is also the god of agriculture. So to make something grow out of stones, to make something uh, grow out of uh, soil, you'll use water. So once again, very symbolic, very uh, pedagogic even. And there is a, a, a meaning and a function to all of those uh, stones which would appear in the story. Bad ones, good ones. It's and Gilgamesh true. really is the beginning of all these yeah. uh, creation legends earlier than any of them. Yeah. And why did Ur disappear? Why did these cultures disappear? Because of lack of water. When the, the exactly. source of water moved back away from their cities, the cities could yeah. no longer survive. Bit by bit you find them struggling with the desertification and it ends. Yeah. That's why the story ends. Another very important aspect, of course, in, in that uh, era we haven't been talking about so much uh, is gold, gold as a material. Gold is one of the, the early noble, the noble metals are defined as silver, I say it in that order, silver, gold, and platinum, because silver was probably the first. Silver is still the noble metal that takes the highest polish from the human hand. And there were many times in many different cultures where silver was even more valuable. Yeah. But why? For the same reason, it could shine, and it lasted. But gold even more because gold didn't tarnish. So you dig gold up in a tomb from 3,000 years ago and it looks like this helmet looks from Mescalamduk. You see a piece of ore, it doesn't always look like that, that's a spectacular piece of ore that I mm. just love that's in the National Museum, Museum of Natural History uh, here in Paris and it was given from California from the early gold yeah. rush to the museum. It looks like a work of art. That's Mother Nature's work of art. Again, we like to show you something like that because you can imagine when our way, way, way back ancestors yeah. stumbled across something like that, they picked it up and they said, well, this is from, this is from whatever runs everything. This is what from runs yeah. the universe. I have it, therefore I must be appointed yeah. by what runs the universe. It's really quite basic and quite true. Mescalamdug, who um, some people say was the, that maybe Queen Puabi, who was the necklace from your earlier piece, might have been one of his wives. It's, it's very murky because mm. there isn't a lot of record, but it's from that same time period, that golden age of Ur. Mescalamdug was known as his, Mescalamdug actually means the king of the good country. And this is a ceremonial helmet for sure with which he was buried. I say ceremonial because gold is malleable. This would not have actually protected him. It looks like a true helmet to be worn in war, but he wouldn't have lasted long with that mm. in war. I'm sure it looks like his exact helmet that he did wear to protect himself. Because look, it has even the openings to yeah. here. It has the duplication of his nice chignon, of his hair. It's very, very elegant and very male glamorous, exactly. I would say. But it's something that comes back to us from ancient, ancient times and gives us a peek into how gold yeah. was valued. Gold was valued that much that it was that exquisitely worked. Look at the hair, look at the details, look at the tiny details, the curls. All of this was worked like that to give Mescalamdug um, protection into the next world. 
and also a symbol for everyone to know of who he was. And talking about protection, it really was at the center of Empress Maria's bulla, which I tend to forget, is this little symbol of Isis as an amulet. Uh, we see these on kids, we see these everywhere today. Yeah. Most people have no idea. They'll be combining those with scarabs and with ladybugs and everything else. But it is literally a mini Isis in what? Carnelian in that red stone. The red was the most important. It's an Egyptian piece from the New Kingdom. It's so beautiful, and there are fantastic ones to see in the Louvre. We chose one from the British Museum to start, but Leonard's going to show you some from the Louvre after. They're great ones in the Metropolitan Museum. They're all over the world, really. Mm. You just have to look for them. And uh, this is talking about that Book of the Dead, which has yeah. 200 different prayers to keep you alive. Book of the Alive, I would rather yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, and if, if you think about uh, Egypt and the Book of the Dead, it was maybe the main country for amulets. They had so many, and the Book of the Dead is listing amulets and amulets, and we could show you like dozens of them. But among the principles were, of course, the uh, Ujat eye, which is supposed to be the eye of uh, Horus. On the, the red, on, on the left, I mean on, on the right, I'm sorry. That he lost in a battle uh, with uh, uh, Thet, and he, uh, Thoth gave him, gave him him back. So there was also this uh, lucky charm uh, already at stake, and then you'll find eyes all around the Mediterranean, in Turkey still today, in, uh, uh, in Greece, among the ships. And so this is just to, to show you the, the echo of such, a, such an amulet. Yeah, every time you see one of those eyes, it actually is descending back from yeah. this Ujat, this eye of Horus, uh, which we talk about in great length. It takes four hours with all the different things we discuss in our talismans course. This one, what about this one, this beautiful blue one? This is a papyrus. Of course, nature, uh, uh, agriculture uh, would be uh, extremely, extremely uh, appreciated. And an even stranger one, because this one we can kind of recognize. But if right. I show you this, You'll be like... What does that look like when you first look at it? Exactly. It very clearly to me looks like vertebrae, like a back x-ray. If you have your x-ray done for slip discs, it looks like the white in between are the discs and the black is the vertebrae. And that's where it is. It's actually the spines, actually, uh, uh, from uh, the spine of Osiris. And then it was associated with columns, with verticality, with stability. It's the amulet that will bring you stability. Today, we don't need stability so much, but when you're a pharaoh, when you're someone in power in Egypt, you need to prosper, you need to have long reign, you need oh. stability. For those in, who would in, like to have some stability, I think in America, we're definitely looking for some stability at the moment. <laughs> um, but what's interesting is, let's remember, the Egyptians knew anatomy. They took everybody apart after they died to put them back together to keep them alive. So they really understood anatomy. They had very advanced medicine. They did brain surgery. Mm -hmm. It's said that they used diamonds to, to do cutting of skulls. So all of it comes back. It all comes around. And while we're still in Mediterranean, there's also myths and typical uh, uh, kind of jewels that were, were made, like in, in uh, um, old Italy before the Roman era, the Etruscans. We're really going to talk about Hercules at the end, so remember our friend Hercules. On the left is a, a Greek vase of uh, Hercules fighting Achilleus, Achilleus, you're supposed to say it in, in uh, Greek, I, I looked it up. So Achilleus, he looks like a bull there. Achilleus was the river god. So he was the god of bringing you everything plentiful, the water, the irrigation. Uh, one of Hercules' labors, the gods were jealous of him. He was too close to being a god as a human. So they gave him these t labors that should finish him off. They expected him to be ruined. He achieved each labor, and that's why we still know who he is, and that's why children still look at him in cartoons. And one of the labors that seemed to be impossible was to dominate Achilleus. Achilleus was the early and original, one of the original shapeshifters. So he went from river to snake to bull. From river to snake, Hercules laughed because Hercules was the baby who had survived because he was able to kill a snake even as a little baby. So he took care of the snake. He wrestled into the ground. Achilleus turns into the bull. Hercules laughs again. It's no problem. Hercules wrestles the bull to the ground, and you can see it in the vase, and pulls off one of his horns. At this point, Achilleus becomes a bays, a bays and is nice and goes back to live in his river. Hercules does not kill him. That horn that's torn off becomes what we all know we see at Thanksgiving time in America, the horn of plenty, the cornucopia, because since it was from Ashaloas, the river of plenty, it flows with fruits and food and everything. On the right, we have a very practical, as Leonard was reminding me, it was a practical young Etruscan man's pendant. Because if you're a young Etruscan man, how great it would be to have the attributes of Ashaloas, to have the plenty, the strength, and, and then also that you, like Hercules, would have dominated Ashaloas and would wear him on your chest. Perfect young man's duel, right? 
it is showing a fantastic example of granulation. Those of us who are Daniel Brush fans, and I'm sure we have some Daniel Brush fans watching tonight, we know how Daniel Brush started doing granulation because of ancient pieces. Look at that. The, the beard is completely, almost the whole thing is almost completely constructed of these little tiny microscopic gr grains. When you think of granulation, look at that. Thanks to some people, a family called the Castellanis, who were doing a restoration of jewels like this in this man, the man who owned this was the Campana in their collection. The Castellanis were able to make a piece like this. It, we have to keep it in order to remember, this is the one from the 1800s and the other one is the ancient <laughs> one. They were able to bring these savoir-faire of ancient times back into European technical ability mm -hmm. and that's why we have the kind of beautiful jewelry we have today, even in something like an Alhambra pendant, which is granulation. Uh, the Hercules not. Hercules, we said save the thought. He's extremely important in, believe it or not, weddings. Now, I have, was explaining this to my French friends because they're not so sure about this, but everyone who speaks English or lives in an English culture knows about the not.com, knows about when you're about to get married. You, the guys will say to each other, are you going to tie the knot? I don't know if mm. I'm going to tie the knot or not, because it was kind of the idea of being tied up into the, the knot. But it comes from the Greeks and from Hercules. Exactly. How? And in every sentimental jewel you'll find in, in ancient Greece, you'll find this strange pattern, which is actually a, a, a sailor's a knot. It's, it's, it, it's a knot, something you cannot break. It's a knot that, that you cannot uh, uh, divide, that, is, that shows unity, that shows strength, that shows um, yeah, the strength of your relationship. And this is why it will be associated with sentimental uh, jewels. But also it's this belt, as you were saying, that it was supposed to be untied by the husband the night of the wedding. And then it will stay quite popular and you'll find in modern days inspiration for Fred, like, 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 for example, this uh, maison, which is uh, half, let's say, uh, an Aracles nut, half a cadenas. And I don't like love locks so much, but it's still quite popular. Yes, it's kind of Paris. the modern knot because people don't, how many people know how to tie a, a figure eight knot like that, a sailor's knot today? Only sailors. So the padlock is kind of the modern. But why is the knot connected to Hercules, you may ask? It's connected because one another one of those labors brings us back to our friend the lion, the poor Nemean lion. Hercules was assigned to kill him. The Nemean lion was unkillable. Well, Hercules managed. And if you could kill the Nemean lion, the skin was going to protect you forever. It could make you invisible. It could make you superpowers again. Yeah. So once Hercules has killed that Nemean lion, he ties that knot, the sailor's un an untieable knot to make sure he keeps it. And that's what we call attributes. You will see Hercules with a kind of lion's head, sometimes on his head, or you'll see the lion's head somewhere on him, and you'll see the paws tied yeah. in that knot on what we like to call attributes, ways we can identify. This is how art historians spend our time. We, we search for attributes. We have a lot of fun. But we're in Paris, <laughs> we're in uh, Bozart Magazine's uh, uh, office, actually, and we couldn't talk about talismans tonight without talking about Maybe the Frenchiest talisman of all, the talisman of uh, Charlemagne. Well, it's French because it was taken from the Germans, actually, because, it, well, it's in Charlemagne. Even Charlemagne is claimed by the, the European, French. Right, 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 yes, because Charlemagne is Charlemagne, Carl, Carl Manus, if you're not French. And uh, Charlemagne has many things attributed to him because Charlemagne was incredible at whatever he did. Well, many mysteries about Charlemagne, but... A significant portion of the European population is descended from Charlemagne. One of the things he did was actually sire hundreds of children and conquer vast amounts of territory by one way or another. A lot of diplomacy was involved too. And the legend says that he was given this talisman uh, either by Irene of Constantinople or by Harun al-Rashid of Iraq, which lets, lets you know how much diplomacy he was exerting because he did have alliances with both. Fact is, we don't, the current our historical knowledge says that this talisman was actually about a hundred years yeah. or more later than Charlemagne. Later, yeah. It's from the Carolingian, from his descendants. Yeah. And it does indeed have a more than 500 carat sapphire. You're looking at a giant sapphire and inside that sapphire with a rock crystal on the other side is purported to be throughout time the milk of the Virgin Mary, hair of the Virgin Mary, and finally, pieces of the original cross. Now, in my opinion, for the number of pieces of the original cross that are all over Europe, in various reliquaries, that was one big cross. But in any case, pieces of the original cross. And helpfully, on the right, we see a drawing 
done by no other than Louis Napoleon, the little Louis Napoleon, uh, who is the nephew of Napoleon the Emperor. And why do we see that? Well, because this talisman had ended up in the hands of Josephine Bonaparte just before she becomes Josephine the Empress. How? How did it go from ostensibly Charlemagne in Aix-la-Chapelle to Paris, and how did it become the ultimate French talisman? Josephine and Napoleon went to take the waters in Aix-la-Chapelle. It's a, their lovely baths there. In August of 1804, at Christmas, they're going to become emperor and empress. The new bishop there, before that, a school teacher. We love school teachers, but he'd gone from school teacher to bishop because no other than Napoleon had appointed him the bishop. <laughs> He's feeling very generous. He decides to present the talisman to Josephine. Because it's a personal gift, Josephine keeps it after the divorce, keeps it with her, and shows it to her son when they're in exile. And her son does that exquisite gouache painting, and she shows it to him as a symbol of how the, the whole tradition of Napoleon and Josephine is believing that, um, excuse me, I'm sorry, Josephine gives it to her daughter Hortense. I don't know what's the matter with me. me. Yeah, Josephine gives it to her daughter Hortense, and Hortense has a little baby who's Louis Napoleon, who's the nephew. And Louis Napoleon makes this wonderful gouache drawing, and Hortense, Josephine's daughter, tells Louis that you are going to take back what is supposed to be the French imperial tradition, the tradition of Charlemagne. You're going to be like Charlemagne with this talisman of Charlemagne, and you will be emperor of France. And guess what? He became Napoleon, Napoleon III. III. Uh, jo Eugenie was going to give it back to Aix-la-Chapelle because she felt maybe it belonged back where it had come from in the, chat in the cathedral. But in 1919, the Germans literally melted the gargoyles off the Reims Cathedral, where all the kings of France had been crowned, and she changed her will. And she sent it, she sent it kept it in Reims, and Very it is now in the Palais de Taux, where you can see it. We made a little movie about it that you can also see on our e-library. Gislain will put up the link if you'd like to go and see the movie. Exactly. So uh, this concludes uh, uh, our, our, our talk today. Uh, and of course, we could talk about many charms. There's still very, very efficient charms today. And uh, we, we'd like to finish by showing you this, this piece. It's not that precious, even if it's, if it's gold. There's a kind of a debate behind this and, and, and me, whether it's, it's English or French. It, it says Saint Christopher, which is not French. But then the car, for me, and the plane, especially, it looks very, very French. But just to, to show you that th those ideas we've been talking about, those traditions, those um, superstitions even, are still, in a way, uh, very, very modern. There's still this strong connection, whether it's the materials, whether it's the patterns, whether it's the symbols, makes it very, very meaningful. And in the end, it's not so much about those materials, not so much about even those objects. It's really about people and the way we're going to use it, we're going to interpret it, we're going to pass it on, something we're going to transmit, something we're going to give power to. And I think this one is a pretty humorous one you'll find in, in many truckers' uh, 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 office, in many, many cars, in many, many uh, transportation uh, uh, systems today. It's supposed to give you luck while uh, uh, carrying on. And St. Christopher, in the little film we're going to make about the medieval jewels in Pilgrim's Badges, St. Christopher was one of the most popular because St. Christopher would protect travelers, so it's not yeah. much difference. Exactly. The idea was that the St. Christopher who had carried the Christ across the water, he was a converted gladiator who'd seen the, to mend his ways and wanted to help people, good people, and he picks up this little baby and carries the baby across the river. Heavy baby, though. Yes, but he's bending over. You see how in the, in, the, in the charm he's bending over like this? He's bending over because the baby's incredibly heavy, and he was a gladiator. He's a giant, monster, strong guy. He's saying to the little baby, why are you so heavy? And the baby whispers in his ear, because I'm carrying the weight of the world, <laughs> and he's Christ. So Christophorus, in Greek, bearing Christ, is Christopher. In case you were named Christopher, that's how you ended up with that name. So if you want to know more about the subject we've been talking about, we're going to send you a few links, we're going to send you a few book references also on the subject that we used to prepare this uh, conference. And uh, also, uh, if you'd like to ask us a question, well, it's uh, uh, the moment, because uh, uh, through uh, all the and social... we also have some upcoming conferences. We have upcoming conferences in... Sorry, 
yeah, we have upcoming conferences. Uh, Leonard will be back December 9th. And exactly. then before that, we have uh, New York architecture, how Paris and New York did point counterpoint with each other during the Roaring Twenties, the Art Deco period, and how the Paris exhibition of modern and industrial arts in 1925 inspired architects and architects built these soaring skyscrapers and then the influence, all the ebullience yeah. and uh, beautiful uh, creation of Art Deco in America influenced back the French jewelers making French and other Art Deco pieces of jewels. And then we're going to talk about flowers and jewelry, a forever healing and lovely discussion at the in the middle, well it's November 20. 4th, 25th, just around Thanksgiving, many times, different time zones. We just checked the time zones. I've had a lot of questions about the time zones. We have all these, it always says the Paris time, but we choose these times so that people in Asia, people in America, people even in California can watch at a convenient time. So check, and if you have any questions, ask us on Instagram about which time zone and we'll help you. And then December 9th and 10th, Leonard and Olivier Segura are going to talk about the more than two years long ongoing research, original research they've done into why and how Paris and the uh, Gulf states were the centers of the world for pearls at the turn of the 20th century. Exactly. No spoilers, we'll talk about it. That's it, that's uh, all I said. That in, didn't spoil in, anything, in did December. it? There's many, many scoops. Um, we would like to thank you very much for uh, your presence, for being with us uh, tonight. Uh, we wish we could we welcome you in our school, in, in L'Ecole, to teach you about all those things. We have a four-hour class, you said it, on uh, amulets and talismans, on many, many other aspects, whether it's geology, craftsmanship, uh, uh, history of uh, uh, jewelry. But maybe you have already a few questions about what we've been discussing tonight. I hope you uh, 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 ask questions, and uh, Gislain is going to gather them, and he's going to now uh, uh, send some uh, uh, so that, that we can answer. So I'm just going to connect uh, back to Gislain. And if you uh, want, in, in addition to the questions, if you have continuing questions, this page, the reason why this page is on the screen is because we, the teachers, uh, use social media for teaching ends, for very positive, fun teaching ends. There's a saying in French, uh, sans suire, c'est se diver de divertir. You can divert yourself, you can entertain yourself in learning. And we really take that seriously. So, if you send messages on Instagram uh, or on Facebook, Leonard or I or all the other teachers will answer you directly. So if you have further questions, don't hesitate to yeah. ask us. And we already have a first question on the talisman of Charlemagne. Uh, interesting that the center of the, in the talisman is a cushion shape, that's true. But the drawing depicts an oval shape. Any thoughts on that? Was the center replaced? Oh, very, very good question. The side you're looking at, how much do I love this? I, I could, you have to stop me because this talisman is a total obsession. Um, I led a group of people from the American Hospital of Paris in a bus to look at it at the Palais de Tau. So if you want, we can get a bus together and we can go look. That side you're looking at is the rock crystal. There's a mystery because there's another, the other half was originally sapphire allegedly and it's gone. And at some point in time, rock crystal replaced it. So you're looking at the rock crystal side. You're looking at a gouache painting by a very talented young man, no other than Louis Napoleon, the son of Hortense, who will become Napoleon III. He's a talented young man. That's his angle that he's looking at. it. The picture you're looking at, we chose that picture. It's kind of a side look. So it's, it, the, the um, sapphire is a sapphire. Again, in the Middle Ages, you didn't change the shape of the stone much. You made it work. So the side you're looking at is the rough, pretty much rough sapphire, natural shape, polished to the point where they needed to polish it. That's that side. The back side, the other side, is what you're looking at in the gouache drawing. And it does, it is quite oval. I have seen both sides and it is quite oval. So um, there's still a hunt on for the missing sapphire, which now and then people say they think they've found <laughs> for the other side. Great question. There's still being uh, studies being made yes. right now on this piece, and it's still like an yes. ongoing, ongoing research. We, we, quite, we know quite a bit already, but I think there's uh, many more, much more to yes. say. Another question, uh, it would be wonderful to know more about another fantastic beast, the phoenix. 
And the Phoenix is quite interesting because it's also very international. We can talk about the bird of fire in Russia. Uh, in Asia, of course, the Phoenix is, would be uh, very, very important. In Europe also. Actually, what I think interesting with the Phoenix is that sometimes it's kind of ambiguous in a piece of jewelry. It could be like a peacock. It could be like a fantastic uh, bird. It's, it's quite, well, we have the bird of paradise, birds of paradise, of course. And I, I like this idea of a bird being able to be many kinds of being uh, open to interpretation in a way. I wish we could take everybody back to an exhibition that closed at the school. The day it closed, we, you know, I cried. I was so sad it was gone because it was called Paradise for Birds. Birds in, par birds in Paradise, but Paradise of Birds and uh, Paradis d'Oiseaux. And we had a 16th century bestiary open for that whole time for everyone to look at. And we had people from six years old to 96 years old looking at a painting of a phoenix in that bestiary and the painting of the phoenix was right next to a painting of an owl. Yeah. So the phoenix was believed to exist. You just hadn't just because you hadn't seen one didn't mm. mean it existed. You didn't leave your town. Yeah. You you didn't even know what the three towns away looked like unless you had permission from the lord you couldn't e leave your town. Mm -hmm. Does that sound familiar? We have to have an attestation to leave our our houses. Welcome back to the middle ages. So uh, you, you, you didn't know what stuff looked like, and you looked in, if you could have the ability to look at a bestiary, you believed it existed. Yeah. And in this wonderful painting, the, it's a bird, it looks kind of like a pigeon almost, or maybe a, maybe a hawk, sort <laughs> of like a hawk, and it was sitting on, comfortably sitting on this sort of comfy nest that was actually flames, yeah. because the idea was that Phoenix could burn up and be born again. Therefore, we have Phoenix, Arizona, we have Phoenix everywhere, because everyone is fascinated with the idea of this bird that can rise from its own ashes. Yeah. And we all love that imagery, exactly. the ultimate healing imagery, you're right. But as you can already tell, we're 19 minutes over, so we better not get into Phoenixes tonight. Yeah. Maybe another, we'll come back with another chapter. Exactly. More questions? No more questions, so we Actually, we can still ask questions if you want yes. on, on social networks. We'll be more than yes. happy to, to answer you. But uh, for the moment, the we books. Have... Should we put up the books? Or? Yes. Some more references also will be sent to you uh, uh, by mail for further discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, to go further, as we as we and like there to is say. the book. Is, the book is in there of the Claude Le, Le Couture, both of his books, English translations, and also the. Um, the Book of the Dead is not there yet, but we'll send you the Book of the Dead, uh, a good version of it done by uh, an Englishman that shows you all the illustrations and all the explanations. That's it for us. Thank you so much, everyone. See you very, very soon, uh, we hope, whether it's at L'Ecole or uh, on your screens.